So let's talk about the cause of death. And I, again, I'm sorry to, to be long-winded, but I have to address the cause of death. Because the state neglected to read perhaps one of the most important sentences from the instruction and why you must read the instruction carefully. Yes, the defendant is criminally liable for all of the consequences of his actions that occur in the ordinary and natural course of events, including those consequences brought about by one or more intervening causes. If such intervening causes were the natural result of the defendant's act. Okay? So if the intervening causes were the natural consequences of the defendant's acts, he's liable. So think about it in this example. Police officer arrests somebody. He puts that person on a hot August afternoon in the back seat of a squad car, rolls up the window, turns on the heat, and leaves the person in there, right? Person dies of a heat stroke. Officer put him in there and is responsible for the natural consequences of his actions. But consider the situation where police officer arrests someone, they're compliant, they go into the back seat of the squad car, they're sitting in the back seat of the squad car, and they have a heart attack. They have a pulmonary embolism. They have a brain aneurysm. Something happens to that person that was not the natural consequence of being arrested. It was just a physiological something that happened to that individual. The officer is not liable because it's not in the natural course of events. And it's not the result, the natural result of the defendant's act. Right? So again, read the entire instruction. The significance of this instruction, again, is that it goes through all of the three charges. You have to be convinced that the defendant's actions caused the death of Mr. Floyd. And throughout the course of this trial, the state has tried and called numerous witnesses to try to convince you that Asphyxiation is the singular cause of death. The singular cause of death. And why is that? It's because actions that happened before Mr. Floyd was arrested that had nothing to do with Officer Chauvin's activities are not the natural consequences of the defendant's actions. You have to focus on the consequence of the defendant's acts. And so the state has tried to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the stress of being arrested and the adrenaline produced as a result of Mr. Floyd's physical resistance played no role. This is what they have to try to convince you. There's no role of that physical exertion played no role in this death. They're trying to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's heart disease played no role in this case. The state must try to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's history of hypertension played absolutely no role in the cause of Mr. Floyd's death. The state must convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd was not experiencing excited delirium that contributed to the cause of his death. The state has to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's paraganglioma was not contributing to the cause of death. The state must convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Floyd's toxicology played no role in his death. Right? The state would have to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that a combination of these pre-existing issues did not contribute to Mr. Floyd's death. That is why the state has brought in expert after expert after expert to testify that the singular cause of death 
The singular cause of death here is asphyxiation. Because if Mr. Floyd was asphyxiated as a result of the police restraint, he is liable for the natural consequences of that restraint of his actions. But if any of these other factors come into it, they, if any of these other factors were substantial contributing factors of Mr. Floyd's death, because they were not the natural result of the restraint. If a person has drugs in their system and that drug causes an overdose in the context of the police restraint, it's not the natural consequence of the restraint, it's the natural consequence of the deceased's actions. So the state has called six experts, really five, but I'll include Dr. Baker. The, the state first called Dr. Tobin, a pulmonologist. Dr. Tobin said that you need to apply common sense to the evaluation of the medical testimony. He testified that Mr. Floyd died exclusively from positional asphyxia, coronary artery disease, hypertension, controlled substances. They played absolutely no role in the death, according to Dr. Tobin. The state called Dr. Eisenschmidt, a toxicologist, to explain to you that Mr. Floyd's toxicological levels were somehow more consistent with a DWI case than a whole bunch of other cases that may or may not have involved an overdose, right? Remember the ratio where you said, well, no, th these are cases, they may have died of something else. They may, may have died of a gunshot wound, but they had fentanyl in their system. So he gave you these strange statistics, but essentially attempting to try to convince you that, he, that these levels are insignificant. People drive their cars around, right? and that therefore the drugs played no role in the death of Mr. Floyd. Third, the state called Dr. Smock, an emergency room physician, right, to explain to you that Mr. Floyd was not experiencing any symptoms of excited delirium, and that coronary artery disease, hypertension, controlled substances, none of that comes into play. They called Dr. Thomas, a pathologist, to testify how she interpreted what Dr. Baker meant. How she concluded that Dr. Baker simply said that the cardiopulmonary arrest is the basic way everybody dies. And she interpreted the reason why Dr. Baker put those factors on his autopsy or on the death certificate were merely for statistical purposes. You put stuff, we just, the CDC requires us to put that stuff on there. And it was an asphyxial death, controlled substances played no role, hypertension played no role, coronary artery disease played no role. They did call Dr. Baker, and we'll talk about Dr. Baker in a minute. And finally, the state called Dr. Rich a cardiologist who concluded that despite a 90% narrowing of the right coronary artery and a 75% narrowing in the left anterior descending artery, despite an enlarged heart and a history of hypertension, that Floyd, Mr. Floyd had a strong heart and that none of those pre-existing and coexisting conditions in any way contributed to the death of Mr. Floyd. I submit to you that the testimonies of Dr. Tobin, Eisenschmidt, Schmack, Thomas, and Rich, it flies in the absolute face of reason and common sense. It, it's, it's astounding, especially when you consider the actual findings of Dr. Baker, right? Because Dr. Baker is the only person who actually performed the autopsy in this case. He's the only person who performed the actual autopsy. He told you that he specifically avoided watching the video because he didn't want to bias or influence his uh, autopsy. He specifically testified that there was no evidence of asphyxia. Right? 
There were no evidence of petechial hemorrhaging. There was no bruising to the neck or back above the skin, under the skin, or into the subcutaneous muscles of the neck and back. And he would expect to see those things in a case like this. There was no finding that pressure was applied to the point to, of Mr. Beck to cause these injuries. There were no injuries to the structures of his neck and that when he finally did review the video, it didn't appear that the placement of the knee affected the structures of the neck because Mr. Floyd could lift up his head, turn his head, move it around. He saw no fractures to the structures of the neck, including the hyoid bone. There were no soft tissue injuries to the sides of Mr. Floyd's neck. There was no hemorrhaging or injury to the hypopharynx. No evidence of life-threatening injury to the neck or spinal column of Mr. Floyd. There was pulmonary edema, which is the swelling of the lungs, which could, could be caused by the resuscitative efforts or fentanyl. There's no evidence of hypoxic changes to the brain. There's no evidence of any brain injury consistent with an asphyx asphyxia death. He found a paraganglioma, and he said it was an incidental a finding. He said his heart was enlarged. Mr. Floyd's heart was enlarged, right? Dr. Baker, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Rich, and Dr. Fowler all agreed. He found narrowing of the right coronary artery, 90% narrowing. He found 75% narrowing of the left anterior descending artery. He's the person who did the talk. He sent out the toxicology samples. Fentanyl level at 11 nanograms per milliliter. Methamphetamine at 0.19 per milliliter. All of these findings that are ultimately relied upon by all of these other experts were done by Dr. Baker. He determined that the manner of death was a homicide, right? Homicide, homicide, homicide. But read the definition again of the medical definition of homicide. It is to be emphasized that the classification of homicide for the purposes of the death certificate is a neutral term and neither indicates nor implies criminal intent, which remains a determination of within the province of the legal processes. Right? The fact that he found this a homicide is a medical term. Dr. Fowler talked about the undetermined manner. Could not be determined is a classification used when the information pointing to one manner of death is no more compelling than one or more other competing manners of death in or through consideration of all available information. Dr. Uh, Baker found the immediate cause of death and the other contributing factors. Cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual neck restraint and neck compression. Other contributing factors are arteriosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, fentanyl intoxication, and recent methamphetamine use. The term complicating in this is important because Dr. Baker is, was able to give you what he said his actual intent was, right? Dr. Thomas speculated about what she thought Dr. Baker meant. Dr. Baker was able to tell you what he meant. He defined complicating as an intervention that occurred an intervention occurred and there was an untoward outcome on the heels of that intervention. And he gave you a specific example. He described a person having a hip surgery and a blood clot comes loose and that blood clot causes a death. The hip surgery didn't cause the death. The death was caused by the blood clot that complicated the surgery. So as I understand his testimony, what Dr. Baker was saying was that there was an unexpected result, the death of Mr. Floyd, occurred during an event where you would not generally expect such a complication, subdual and restraint. He specifically testified, Dr. Basic Baker specifically testified that if he put it on the death certificate, it played a role in the death. 
if something is insignificant to death, you don't put it on the death certificate. So Dr. Baker's conclusions that Mr. Floyd's arteriosclerotic and hypertensive disease played a role in the death of Mr. Floyd. Dr. Baker concluded that Mr. Floyd's fentanyl intoxication played a role. Dr. Floyd's, excuse me, Dr. Baker concluded that Mr. Floyd's recent methamphetamine use played a role. Right? Dr. Baker described that this death of Mr. Floyd was a multifactorial process. A multifactorial process is how he defined it. No single factor, one over the other, played any more of a result, played any more of a role resulting in Mr. Floyd's death. He said his heart simply couldn't handle it within the context of the subdual and restraint. Apparently, the state, as they just argued, wants you to believe what you see. And they did not like Dr. Baker's conclusions. And you can see the process Dr. Baker talked about when he had several meetings, right? This happened in March, this happened in May, June, July. By August, talked to a pulmonologist, talked to an emergency room doctor, not within my area of expertise. Talk to a cardiologist, right? He, his findings didn't support the notion that what you see is what you should believe. And so the state did that. They went and hired Dr. Tobin, right? A pulmonologist. Now, Despite all of the information that Dr. Baker has concluded or found during the actual autopsy, Dr. Tobin concluded emphatically that Mr. Floyd's death was the result of positional asphyxia, right? The pressure of the, of the asphalt, the pressure of the, of the weight of the officers, the positions, all of this resulted in hypoxia, low oxygen to the brain, Mr. Floyd was asphyxiated through positional asphyxia. Remember at the beginning of my remarks, I asked you to perform an honest assessment of all of the evidence in the case. And I'm gonna to submit to you that with no other witness should this be more carefully analyzed. I wanna illustrate two brief things that Dr. Tobin testified about, and I wanna illustrate how I think that these demonstrate a bias, because you still have to consider an expert witness in the context of bias. I'm gonna call it the finger and knuckle testimony and the toe lifting testimony. You may remember this slide, right? That this slide shows George Floyd pushing his fingers against the street to lift his shoulder off the street that he was pushing his knuckles against the tire. Right? He described what he interpreted this was basically Mr. Floyd trying to push himself up into, onto his left, onto his left side to free the right lung to help him breathe. Look at the timestamp of the photos taken from the body-worn camera here. They were taken at 8.19.35. 15 seconds after Mr. Floyd was placed on the ground. Yet Dr. Tobin that he also explained that Mr. Floyd went on to breathe for an additional five minutes and 51 seconds until he took his last breath at 8.25. He neglects the fact that at this point, this is the point that we just saw when Mr. Floyd is taken out of the car and he is actually in the side recovery position for about the first two minutes of this nine minutes and 29 seconds. 
Not moving. Mama. Mama. Yeah, Mama. Mama. One of the front pouches. Mama. On my right side back. Mama. Mama. Ah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. All right. All right. Oh my God. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, man. Mama, I love you. Reese, I love you. You got Pablo? Yeah, my kids, I love him. I'm dead. Why is it my side? It's listed. It's uh, like. Uh, uh, I can't Pablo? breathe for nothing, man. It's cold, good, man. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, <laughs> Mama, I love you. I can't do nothing. Yeah, your mess is on their way. My face is gone. Uh, 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 I can't breathe, man. Please. Please, please, please let me stay in. Please, man, I can't breathe. Can you get up on the sidewalk, please? One side or the other, please. My face get up bad. Here, should we get his legs up? Oh, my God. Nope, just leave him. Just leave him. Just leave him. Yep, just leave him. Ah. All right. Yeah, I'm dead. Hopefully Park's still sitting on the car. Oh, Look at my face, man. How can you take, this illustrates how you can take a single nanosecond of time in this arrest. You can have this testimony that he's pushing his body up to try to breathe, right? But when you look at the evidence compared to the rest of the evidence, what do you really see? You see a person who is on his side, being held in the side recovery position, whose hand is touching the ground and the tire at times. You cannot take a single isolated frame and reach any conclusions. Because much like the use of force, the cause of death has to be considered within the totality of the circumstances. And then you may remember, you may remember this testimony. This is Officer Chauvin's foot off the ground. And he described how at this precise moment, Officer Chauvin was applying 91.5 pounds of pressure to the neck of Mr. Floyd. So let's look at this time in the context of the other evidence. How long I gotta hold him down? This is why we don't do drugs, kids. about drugs, bro. You understand it. Did anybody even see the toe come up off the ground? I mean, was it half a second, a quarter of a second? Right? But when you take a single incident, a frame, a single frame, and you add the drama, and you make all of the assumptions, right? Officer Chauvin's body weight, Mr. Floyd's EELV, he's the only person who calculated the EELV based upon the presumptions of health, based upon studies, based upon theory, all of this information, you can, you can put this into a single frame, but you have to analyze the evidence in the broader context. You can also see during the clip that Officer Chauvin actually re, is sort of adjusted forward and touches this car, right? You can make a lot of in, informed decisions about what, how is he shifted. If I'm shifting my weight this way, majority of my weight is shifting on my left foot. If I'm this way, it's on my right foot. You watch this video and you can see the dynamic shifting. And you can see the placement of the toes, right? The toe tucked under helps an officer maintain his weight or helps any person maintain their weight. But a toe flopped over to the side, it's a little harder to balance. You cannot take a single frame and draw conclusions, you have to look at the totality. And remember, he said he spent 150 hours analyzing this tape. 
His entire testimony is filled with theory, speculation, assumption. Do not let yourselves be misled by a single still frame image. Put the evidence in its proper context. We have to talk about the toxicology. Again, we're not suggesting that this was an overdose death, right? It's a multifactorial process, as Dr. Baker said. So we have to look at what role does the toxicology play in this case. And you need, because again, we had Dr. Eisenschmidt who testified that he found that the levels of uh, fentanyl and methamphetamine were more consistent with this DUI population. But what do we know about the actual toxicology? There were 11 nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl and 0.19 nanograms of methamphetamine. Those are the principal two fam findings. And additionally, what we know is that the byproduct of methamphetamine, which is amphetamine, was not reported at the levels. Doesn't mean it wasn't technically there, but it was not reported. So it's below threshold reporting values, which, signif which signifies that the, amph the methamphetamine use was recent. Hence, in Dr. Baker's death certificate, he included the recent methamphetamine use because there was no amphetamine. The history of Mr. Floyd's use of controlled substances, it's, it is significant. It's, it's not a character problem. Millions of Americans suffer from opioid, the opioid crisis, right? I mean, it is, a, it is a true crisis that this country is facing. But it is significant to understand the history, not just as much as the long-term history, but his long-term history provides us with insight on how his body physically reacts to methamphetamine or, or opioid use, I should say, opioid use within the context of a law enforcement encounter. We know from the testimony of Courtney Ross that Mr. Floyd struggled. We know he had been using controlled substances habitually for some time. We know that on May 6th of 2019, during an encounter with the police, Mr. Floyd ingested some controlled substances, said they were Percocets. He was startled by the police, like he was in this case. Officer drew his gun in that case too. And that resulted in a blood pressure of 216 over 160. I mean, that's not just high. That is skyrocketing high. We know from Ms. Ross that in March of 2020, they purchased some pills that were supposed to be Percocets, an opioid. But they were clearly knockoffs. She described that. They were clearly knockoffs. She described how those pills made her feel. They kept her up all night, right? The introduction of the methamphetamine. We know from Ms. Ross that in March of 2020, Mr. Floyd was seen for a drug overdose. She described how he felt in that instance. She said his whole body hurt, his stomach hurt. We know based on, again, for Miss Ross, that he was clean and sober for some time while they were in quarantine. We know that Miss Ross again described taking about a week before a similar pill to the one that they had back in March. Kept her up again all night, right? She said she felt like she was gonna die. We know, again, for Miss Ross, that those pills were purchased from Maury's Hall. She described going to a hotel while Mr. Floyd went into the hotel. She was on the phone with him. She heard Maury's Hall's voice. We know Mr. Floyd was with Maury's Hall on May 25th, 2020. 
we heard from the store clerk, Christopher Martin. He described Mr. Floyd as being high. His responses were delayed, right? He may have been, you know, standing around. He may have been standing up. He may have been able to have communications. But Mr. Martin clearly described him as being high. We heard from Shawanda Hill that when they got back into the car, right, they had a conversation for a few minutes, and suddenly Mr. Floyd fell asleep. All of these things become important, that he had trouble, they had trouble waking him up. She called her daughter for a ride because they couldn't wake her up, wake Mr. Floyd up. They couldn't keep him awake. We heard how Mr. Martin described Mr. Floyd when he went to back to the car and how he was, oh, no, and he wasn't speaking, right? But he kept putting his head back and shaking his head. We know from Peter Chang's body-worn camera that Maurice Hall also described that Mr. Floyd was dozing off. He got to see because he was falling asleep a little bit, and then when he woke up, they was up at the door. Right? We know that whether Mr. Floyd was chewing gum while he was in the, court, the store, we can also see he was eating a banana. Right? He bought a banana. So we know when we look at this picture, right, there's something in Mr. Floyd's mouth. Is it gum? Is it banana? Is it drugs? Nobody knows. Right? But regardless of whether it's drugs, bananas, or gum in this incident, we know that there were pills in the car. Right? We know that there were drugs in the car. We know those pills were later tested to be a combination of methamphetamine and fentanyl. That's what was in Mr. Floyd's system. It's relevant because it's what was in his system. These are the pills that were found. We know at some point Mr. Floyd was handcuffed. His hands were behind his back. It would have been physically impossible to put anything in his mouth at that point. And we know that in the squad car, 320 were pills. We know those pills were analyzed. We know those pills consisted of fentanyl and methamphetamine. We know that Mr. Floyd's salivary DNA was found on those pills. How much fentanyl does it take to kill? This is from the Minneapolis Police Department's training. Approximately two to three milligrams. Smaller than a penny. This is from the squad car. You can look at these pictures closely during the course of your evidence. There is a video of Mr. Floyd, when Mr. Floyd is, is being subdued by and restrained by the police Mr. Maurice Hall reaches into his bag. He's looking through the windows. We watch it. And then he throws something. 
right? We know that Mr. Floyd had drugs in his mouth. We know that some percentage of that would have been consumed and absorbed into his system. We don't know how much he took before, right? We don't know when he took an earlier dose in relation because fentanyl had actually started to metabolize in his, so fentanyl was longer before. For the medical experts to minimize the timing and the amount of illicit drugs that were found in Mr. Floyd's bloodstream it is just simply incredible to me. It is incredible to me. Every single doctor testified that relevant to the, that the absence of signs of fentanyl uh, overdose weren't present because he was alert, he was talking. But it ignores what Shawanda Hill and Maurice Hall says, right? That he was all of a sudden asleep and difficult to wake up. It ignores the fact that the combination of these two drugs, methamphetamine is a powerful stimulant. Fentanyl is a powerful sedative. They use it for surgeries. Every single doctor dismissed outright, no, no, nothing about this case. Well, it was only 0.19 grams, nanograms per milliliter. It's such a small amount of methamphetamine in his system. It's a vasoconstrictor. It causes the heart's arteries to constrict even tighter. Doesn't matter. Every single doctor just brushed it aside, said it would have no effect. I ask, would any of those doctors prescribe illicit methamphetamine to their patients? Would they give it to their children? Would they give it to their elderly parents with a 90% blockage of the coronary artery, the right coronary artery? I guarantee you the answer is no. Dr. Rich is the only one who said, I would never recommend to my patients that they take any amount of illicit methamphetamine. It is preposterous that it is a preposterous notion that this did not come into play here. A half hour break for lunch. Oh, I, I don't want to interrupt your argument, but. I apologize. It's Members of the jury, 30 minutes for lunch, please. Thank you. Before the break, we were talking about the controlled substances and the role that they uh, were, were, the levels that they were found in, the role that they may have applied or, or uh, contributed to Mr. Floyd's death. And I was suggesting to you that it is, again, this death needs to be looked at. Mr. Floyd's death needs to be looked at as Dr. Baker describes a multifactorial process. This is the way the human body works. The heart beats, the lung breathes, the blood circulates, the brain thinks, the brain controls all of our movements, right? All of this. And to simply come in and say, this particular substance or these combinations of substances when taken in con combination with each other, when taken in combination with a, of a person who has blockage in the heart, substantial, significant blockage in the heart, when we know that these drugs play a particular role in, the, in, in how the blood circulates, to just poo-poo it and say it has nothing to do with anything is just really a preposterous notion. Yet Dr. Baker, Dr. Fowler, and Dr. Thomas have all certified deaths at levels less than 11 nanograms per milliliter or 19 nanograms or combination, right? These deaths have been certified on that basis alone. And it didn't necessarily contain any of the other issues that were confronting Mr. Floyd on that day. 
Likewise, again, every other doctor that has testified has gone to great lengths to dismiss the role of Mr. Floyd's heart disease and hypertension in this case. Forensic pathologists define coronary artery disease resulting in death. It can, death can occur with 70 to 75 percent blockage. That is sufficient to cause the, a person's death. Every pathologist who testified in this case has indicated likewise that they have certified deaths with those types of blockage and attributed it to the coronary artery disease. Yet here again, this has played zero role. Dr. Rich testified Mr. Floyd had a healthy heart. Coronary heart disease, not relevant, according to the state. Hypertensive disease, not relevant. Drugs acting to further constrict an already heart, diseased heart, not relevant. Adrenaline coursing through Mr. Floyd's body, not relevant. What does adrenaline do? It further constricts the arteries, right? Adrenaline from the paraganglioma wasn't there, didn't happen, played no, no role. They just want you to ignore significant medical issues that presented to Mr. Floyd. And the failure of the state's experts to acknowledge any possibility, any possibility at all, that any of these other factors in any way contributed to Mr. Floyd's death defies medical science and it defies common sense and reason. Now, Dr. Tobin ascribes the death of Mr. Floyd essentially, as I understand again, to hypoxia, low oxygen resulting uh, in brain, going to the brain, low oxygen to the brain. Dr. Fowler also ascribes the death to a hypoxic death, but that the heart was the, was the muscle that did not get the oxygen, resulting in a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. The reasons that Dr. Fowler dismissed the notion of brain hypoxia are because number one, hypoxia of the brain results in certain observable symptoms. The brain demands more oxygen, right? It takes 20% of our oxygen to function the brain, even though it's one of the, it's, it's a smaller percentage of our body. It is the most sensitive to the loss of oxygen, and it reveals a progressive set of symptoms. Confusion, which was not exhibited, right? Because if you compare the, if you compare the testimony about how, whether Mr. Floyd was intoxicated, well, he didn't exhibit any confusion. Right? Restlessness, not exhibited. Shortness of breath, it was complained of, but that is also a sensation that can be caused by a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. Visual changes, not complained of. Incoherent speaking, not complained of. When someone is experiencing hypoxia to the brain, as Dr. Tobin stated, you would see an increased ventilation or respiratory rate. Dr. Tobin said it is a completely normal respiratory rate, 22 breaths per minute. The timeline in this case is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. At 8.23 and 58 seconds, Mr. Floyd speaks. I really can't breathe. If you can speak, you have oxygen in your brain. At 8.24.09, he again verbalizes, please, I can't breathe, indicating at 824.09 that his brain has oxygen and there is no impairment to his airway. 39 seconds later, Mr. Floyd goes limp at 824 and 48. A person can hold their breath for 39 seconds, right? That does not result in hypoxia in 39 seconds. 27 seconds later, according to Dr. Tobin, Mr. Floyd takes his last breath. It's a total of 66 seconds, one minute and six seconds from the time that we know there's enough oxygen in his brain to speak, no occlusion to the airway at that point, 66 seconds to his, from his last word to his last 
breath. This timeline is consistent with a sudden cardiac arrhythmia. It is not consistent with the longer process of brain hypoxia. Dr. Fowler's final analysis was that Mr. Floyd died from a cardiac arrhythmia due to atherosclerotic and hypertensive cardiovascular disease during restraint by police. Other significant factors, fentanyl intoxication, methamphetamine intoxication, possible CO, carbon monoxide exposure, and the paraganglioma. What role did Mr. Carbon monoxide play in Mr. Floyd's death? We don't know. No, nothing was ever tested as far as the vehicle is concerned. We don't know if the car was emitting carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. We don't know. One thing we do know is that it was running. And how can we tell that it was running? Because in the video we watched earlier, when Thomas Lane pulls in that squad car at Cup Foods, he puts it in gear, he takes it out of gear, he puts it in park, he never touches the keys of that vehicle, and he gets out. The car was running. I have one last point to make, and I should be fa fairly quick with this. The superseding cause that was discussed. A superseding cause is, an, is a cause that comes after the defendant's acts, alters the natural sequence of events, and is the sole cause of a result that would not have otherwise occurred. Now, let's look at the medical timeline. We know that EMS was called initially at code 2 at 8.20 and 11 seconds. We know that EMS was stepped up to code 3 at 8.21 and 35 seconds. We know that EMS responded to Cub Foods, based on uh, the videos, at 8.27 and 27 seconds. We know that EMS called for fire at 20.38.36. It takes approximately three minutes for EMS and the arresting officers to put Mr. Floyd into the ambulance, and the ambulance pulls away from Cup Foods at 8.30 and 17 seconds. Fire responds to Cup Foods at 8.32.59. That's four minutes and 15 seconds after they were called. That's pretty close in consideration to the three-minute expectation of Ms. Hansen. But the ambulance had driven several blocks away to 36 and Park, arriving sometime between 831 and 833. That's one and a half, and we know that because there are two exhibits, 62 and 63, that were introduced. 62 shows one paramedic and Officer Lane in the back. 63 shows two paramedics and Officer Lane in the back. So somewhere between a minute and a half to three minutes to get to 36th and Park where they began the resuscitative efforts. The first air is pumped into Mr. Floyd per Dr. Tobin at 20.35.06. That is 10 minutes after Mr. Floyd went unconscious per Dr. Tobin, but it is 7 minutes and 46 seconds after EMS responded to Cup Foods. We ultimately know that the ambulance left uh, 36 and Park at 8.48 and 23 minutes. It arrived at HCMC at 8.53, shortly after 8.53. So it took about five minutes to get from 36 and Park to HCMC. What if you, what would have happened if EMS had started resuscitative efforts right away? What would have happened if rather than driving to 36 and Park, they went to the hospital? They would have been there in that time. I am not suggesting to you, I am not suggesting to you that the ambulance paramedics did anything wrong. But it raises the prospect of that continued delay in resuscitation. What if EMS had administered Narcan? We heard that it would not have hurt him, and it could have helped him. I'm not blaming the paramedics. More importantly, 
done this analysis in this analysis is it shows that human beings make decisions in highly stressful situations that they believe to be right in the very moment it is occurring. There's lots of what ifs that could have happened, what could have happened, what should have happened. Lots of them in lots of regards. But we have to analyze this case from the perspective of a reasonable police officer at the precise moment with the totality of the circumstances when it comes to the use of force. We have to look at the cause of death to determine did Mr. Floyd die exclusively of asphyxia or were there other contributing factors that were not the natural result of Mr. Chauvin's acts? Right? Things that happened that were set in motion before Mr. Chauvin ever arrived. The drug ingestion, right? the bad heart, the diseased heart, the hypertension, all of these things existed before Mr. Chauvin arrived. The struggle, what role did the struggle play? We know, based on a prior incident, that Mr. Floyd's heart was beating at 219 over 160 in a, in a situation where he was confronted by police and had ingested drugs. He didn't die that day. All of this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of this, when you take into consideration the presumption of innocence, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I would submit to you that it is nonsense to suggest that none of these other factors had any, any role. That is not reasonable. And when you, as members of the jury, conclude your analysis of the evidence, when you review the entirety of the evidence, when you review the, the law as written, and you conclude it all within this, all within a, a thorough, honest analysis, the state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, Mr. Chauvin should be found not guilty of all kinds.